And so the bridge then cantilevers out one segment at a time, balancing on each side. So it's a balancing trick. The aspect which I think is most rewarding is its visual appearance. It is the signature structure of the whole of the railway. And it's the sort of bridge that if you put it on a stamp, it's immediately recognisable as the emblem of the Channel Tunnel Rail Link project. While crews build bridges and dig tunnels, others are working at the end of the line in London, where the other emblem of High Speed One faces its makeover. The whole project is a massive achievement. But if I have to pick out one aspect of it which sticks in the mind more than anything else, it has to be St Pancras, because of the challenges weren't just engineering. They were a question of actually thinking about how people would use the space and how it functioned. Engineer Ailey McAdam is tapped to transform St Pancras station from has-been to must-see. Wow, you've got the opportunity to turn what is a beautiful building. It was beautiful, but it was, it was old and there was a lot of repair that was required. It was dark and dingy and wet in some places, but clearly the potential was there. I think my feeling was got the opportunity to change this building into something that is going to live for another 150 years. Although that's counted with, I knew what the programme was at that time, I knew what the budget was, and it was like, what? They want us to do what? By when? For how much? St Pancras will actually become four stations in one. The High Speed One terminus for Eurostar, a high speed commuter link to South East England, a new station on the London Underground, and a rail link to the region north of London. But then there wasn't room to get all of the domestic train services into the original train station because we now have 13 platforms in total. There isn't even room for the Eurostars, twice as long as other trains. They build an extension the length of five football fields. In the old terminal, work begins on the centrepiece of the station, the roof. After it was bombed in the World Wars, the glass was replaced with solid panels. But Londoners like their light. We've been able to reasonably faithfully recreate what the original designer, William Barlow, had conceived for the roof, which was this cathedral, really, of light coming into a fantastic operating station. And I like to think we've been true to Barlow's original design. I like to be think he's looking down at us now and saying, OK, they, those guys made me proud. But down below, they hit a brick wall. As charming as a dungeon, the windowless lower level was once used to store beer barrels. They used to bring the passengers in during the daytime and Midlands Burton beer at night time and then distribute it into London. The dilemma was that this space was not seen to be usable and I felt that that was a complete waste of an asset and as a consequence uh, spent a little bit of time, in fact quite a lot of time, thinking about how we could use the space, the, the beer cellar. The answer is heavenly. Cut open the ceiling and let there be light. What it's done is, is light up the whole station. You now get light streaming down through the roof, down through the light wells, down into the undercroft. It's fantastic. What was once a liability is now an asset. Yet once again, solve one problem, create another. Finding a solution to the space below the platforms wasn't quite as straightforward as we had hoped. 
The famous arch of the station in its day was the largest clear span roof in the world. Any arch structure wants to try and spread, and to avoid that spread, the platform deck had provided the tie structure. Without the ties, the arch wants to thrust outwards. So we had to replace the ties with a concrete slab to see in front of you. The slab not only holds the arch together, it bears the weight of the extra long Eurostars. But still, another problem. The platform rests on more than 700 original cast iron columns, as sturdy as ever. But the old wrought iron beams above them can't bear the new load. Directly you put that kind of load onto it, it's, um, it will essentially snap like a carrot. And we overcame that with what is perhaps the cleverest little detail on the project. Few visitors will ever notice it. A round bearing is inserted atop each column and below each beam. Four struts made of a high-strength steel alloy bracket each beam. The struts divert the load of the platform from the bearing and onto the column, bypassing the beam. Very simple device, very easily installed, and it meant that we did not have to touch the actual historic structure by welding things onto it or gluing things onto it. So far, they've made use of space. Now to make time. To stay on schedule, they have to work on three levels at once. So we actually had to be doing the work on the roof at the same time as we were rebuilding and restoring the platform level at the same time as we were cleaning and repairing the undercroft. So to make it possible, we actually had three complete workforces working simultaneously. Which has its, obviously, its construction um, phasing challenges and also its safety challenges when you've got guys working, at, working on three levels. There are some rails running along, which had been the original rails for a cleaning gantry. And we used those and we hung a scaffold with a complete soffit to that scaffold, and that was crucial because safety was very important to us, and we didn't want the possibility of any workman either himself falling or dropping tools onto workmen at this level. Or injuring passengers. St Pancras could be renovated in half the time if they could shut it down. But local trains come and go, day and night. We at times had two and a half thousand construction workers. We had commuters and we didn't have a single fatality and we had very, very few serious accidents. So that was a fantastic achievement. While St Pancras gets a mega facelift, engineers down the line hit a mega hurdle. Near the River Thames, High Speed One will cross the Queen Elizabeth II Bridge and the M25 motorway, one of Britain's busiest highways. Here's the tricky part. Construction must pass under the bridge and over the road without stopping traffic. Engineers again turn to push launch. And if you were to take time-lapse photography, you would see the bridge literally creeping out across the landscape. It was like threading the needle through that space and could not have been done by any other construction technique without closing the motorways. Thirty-five kilometers from completion, High Speed One reaches an obstacle it can't bridge or bypass. The Thames Tunnel represented the largest single risk on the whole of the project. The risks, cave-in, flooding and failure. 
The Thames Tunnel is actually two tunnels side by side, each seven meters across and more than two kilometers long. And so deep, you could stand a 10-story building underwater. Digging mega tunnels takes a mega machine. A tunnel boring machine, or TBM. Technology draped in mystique. Tunnelers are, are probably similar to mariners in their superstitions. Um, uh, all the TBMs have to have a, a female name and it's considered very unlucky to ever change the name. Hayden Davis will help build the London tunnels and this is his baby. This is a typical example of, um, of a, a London tunnels uh, machine. This is the working end, this is the cutter head. The teeth are made of a hardened steel alloy and the entire head is attached to a sealed chamber called a plenum. The only time you'll ever see it working is when it finishes. Here's what goes on out of sight. As the teeth scour the rock, the debris falls into the plenum. From the plenum, debris flows out via a giant corkscrew called an Archimedes screw. The debris moves along conveyor belts to the end of the tunnel. The entire machine is as long as a football field. Inching the TBM forward are 29 hydraulic rams. As the cutter head is going round, cutting the ground, these rams act on the last ring belt, shove the whole thing forward, including all this backup equipment, until there's enough space here to build another ring, which is one and a half metres wide. Each ring is formed of 10 precast segments brought by train from the head of the tunnel. Then this red piece here comes into play, and this is called the segment erector. Even concrete segments have to be handled gently. Chipping opens channels for water. The segment erector uses vacuum suction. It picks up the individual segments for the ring, places them in position, and the miners bolt them together. And once the ring is complete, the rams can then move against the last ring built and start the cycle all over again. Every minute, the machine normally moves forward about the length of a finger, a hundred millimetres. A uh, hundred millimetres a minute doesn't sound a lot, but when, when these machines are working 24-7, on a good day, they can build over 50 metres of tunnel. Like other tunnelers on the route, they run into a familiar hazard, chalk. We knew that it had deep fissures in it, and we knew that those fissures would be containing water. 40 metres below the Thames, the pressure on the cutter head is four times the pressure on the surface. If water breaches the cutter head, it could flood the TBM and drown the crew. On a previous tunnel project, uh, I've been in the tunnel when, when the lining was breached. Um, I can only uh, compare it probably to, to a, a submarine being depth charged. To counteract the pressure, the plenum behind the cutter head is equally pressurized. It's called an earth pressure balance system. And what happens with the earth pressure balancing is that if there was a sudden inflow of water during the tunnel operation, the pressurization in the plenum would respond and balance out the pressure. Thanks to the pressurized plenum, crews bore ahead without a single breach. After 15 months, the TBMs emerge from beneath the Thames. By foreseeing trouble and heading it off, they've jumped ahead of schedule. But more tunnelling lies ahead, as daunting as the Thames, beneath the streets of London. Digging a railway under a metropolis gives architecture the jitters. <laughs> 